welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a returning good brother to the temple, creator of Cross Time. The, the game of time-traveling espionage. The one and only Emlyn Freeman. How are you doing today, man? I'm doing all right. It's good to be back. Welcome back. As my chiropractor often says, glad to see you're back. I'm pretty sure that joke is done to death, but I have never been... <laughs> I haven't, I, I haven't um, been willing to further beat with a dead horse. <laughs> yes, not beat a dead horse. I will beat a joke with a dead horse. Yes, indeed. So, now we you've been on here before when it came to Americana. Um, mm -hmm. So I will skip, so I won't do the origin story part because I don't redo that. <laughs> sure. But instead, I'd like to di I'd like to dive into your first introduction to the fate system. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, gosh, uh, what was my first introduction to the faith system? I believe it was Spirit of the Century, um, way which would have been back in twenty, oh, yeah, uh, to twenty ten or so, something like that. Um, I I honestly don't remember how I came across it. Um, it, uh, but it. It was the my definitely my first iteration of fate that I got um, exposed to. I may have been looking for for a, an open system to uh, to use to, for my own work. Uh, that sounds like the sort of thing that I was doing at the time. Mm -hmm. um, so that that may have been my my, my first interaction with it. And then uh, uh, I I enjoyed. Sort of the century ran it a little bit, uh, started using it, and then uh, the Dresden files um, as a, a baseline for some uh, for actually the original iteration of Cross Time. Um, I was working on it before Fate Core came out, which kind of uh, re, but when uh, that kind of. Uh, changed a lot of my thinking about fate because it's, it's a pretty significant addition change. Um, and so that, that was, um, so this, this cross time project has been floating around in my head, um, in one way or another since college. Uh, it started out as a, um, so some some bits and pieces of it started out as a one act play, and then it went into idea of a television show, and then it went into the idea of a fate system, mm -hmm. uh, fate, fate system game, and then I I ended up setting it aside for a number of years, um, and then came back to it as a cortex system game uh, because it was because I I designed a similar game. Uh, reality redacted in the cortex system and uh, I thought you know why redo a bunch of work uh, so I could use a lot of the same uh, same work from cortex and uh, make it sort of a spiritual sequel because uh, uh, both both espionage games with espionage with superpowers uh, so I decided to do that um, and did not, uh, take into account when I was doing the, the that design that uh, the cortex system had changed hands, and the and uh, I didn't check with the new uh, the new company about their uh, licensing and discovered that they are not currently licensing the cortex system. So I did a bunch of work that uh, will never see the light of day unless they change their minds. Uh, and so then I went back to my old fate work uh, on the system, uh, and then uh, and took some uh, some of the ideas that I had from the cortex version and spliced them together to create what is the the current version of cross time. Um, 
So yeah, that's it's kind of the the history of of my of a. Uh, of this game, uh, I've I've done a, other work with Fate. Uh, this is giving my Fate second published Fate game. Uh, my first published game, uh, Strange Voyages, from twenty fifteen or twenty sixteen, um, uh, was a Fate game uh, designed in Fate Core. Um, that was a, a game about Elizabethan explorers traveling into the lands of legend and myth. Um, so, uh, that's, that's my, my history with fate. It's, it's always been a a system that I've really enjoyed. I, I like, uh, how it's, um, it's fairly open and, um, not very, not terribly crunchy, but has enough levers to, to mess with that it, it can be, it's, uh, it's interesting to, uh, to work with. Okay. Um, so it's it's you know it's I have, I feel like it's a little crunchier than say uh, Powered by the Apocalypse, um, and so it's a little more uh, fun to to design in uh, because of that, um, while being less uh, fewer fewer levers to to mess with than Cortex. Uh, a little less crunchy than than Cortex, and those are the three systems I've really designed in. Um, yeah, I can, I can certainly get that. Now, with that with that said, is is Cross Time meant to be compatible with both Fate and Fate Accelerated? Um. Well. It's it's designed as a a f- fate core game, um, and uh, I did use some uh, language from it from their fate condensed system. Um, it's not directly compatible with fate accelerated because I don't use like the um, the approaches system that's uh, that's part of fate accelerated. Uh, but you know, all of the fate games are essentially the the you know at the at the core they're the same that would take very little work to uh if you're jo- only familiar with accelerate fate accelerate to understand and and follow along with how I'm how I'm using the fate system for cross time um in fact I've I, I've you know t- taken bits and pieces from a lot of different places I even um used uh some of the uh I don't remember what they Called Atomic Robo. Um, mm-hmm. There's a there's a system for how they use their um, their skill system uh, modes. That's what they call it, and that's uh, uh, basically the, how I decided to use the the skill system for Cross Time and the the final version um, to kind of uh, I took some of the concepts uh, regarding what are called the the six methods of of uh, espionage spycraft work um, that I used in the reality redacted game and uh, turned that into the using the mode system from Atomic Robo. Mm-hmm. I can I can certainly get that. Now, I think. I think when I had you on for Americana, I had talked about the concept of Appendix N and just the the inspirational media that played a factor in the creation of that. So I'd like to repeat that question for Cross Time. Sure. Um, yeah, that's uh, there have been a, a number of of game of games, movies, books, and such that that uh, s- came came into it um probably the the biggest uh single influence is, is terminator um from the the idea of soldiers traveling through time to uh to change uh change time or or prevent t- time from being changed um 
and uh, I've also definitely gotten some inspiration from um, some some stuff that's a little, little newer, like uh, the um, uh, the the TV show Travelers uh, is is really. Uh, it maps almost directly onto uh, the the cross time concept because it's about uh, well trained time travelers that are have specialties that are essentially spies that <laughs> go back in time to change history. Um, I uh, so that that that's there wasn't an influence on the original version of the game because I started developing the original version of the game before Travelers came out, but uh, it's definitely kind of mm -hmm. spoken to the, the newer version. Yeah. Um, one of the uh, odd uh, inspirations was the the <coughs> card game Chrononauts. Uh, it's, a, it's a game where you uh, travel through time changing history uh, basically mm -hmm. around what are called in the game um, tipping points, I believe. Uh, where are it's uh, there's like specific events in the the game represented by cards that you can change like Kennedy's assassination and the Titanic disaster and uh, Columbine and stuff like that and um, the actually Columbine may have been a something that's affected not changed changeable anyway uh, but then there's uh, uh, knock-on effects, uh, I think were called ripple points in the game, where, you know, if you change Kennedy uh, getting... Uh, if Kennedy gets saved, then that affects the moon landing and uh, stuff like that. And so that, that was uh, an inspiration to... Because Cross Time is centered around the idea of changing history in by going back to specific points that are uh, called uh, change points in the game that are, are designed, not designed, um, identified by the by the, the time travelers as um, good places to change history to, you know, this this is going to ripple down the timeline to change things in the way that we want. And so that... Uh, that concept of identifying specific time places in time that would ripple down the timeline definitely came from uh, Chrononauts. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Let's see. Uh, I'm um, sure someone's brought up Time Cop to you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I've never really cared for Time Cop. It's not one that, that really... Uh, uh, I've I've seen it certainly, but it's I've only seen it once. Never never had a particular desire to see it again. And uh, the cross time, you you don't have the problem of when you touch yourself, you turn into me weird melty nonsense. Um, uh, the the last piece of inspiration I'll note is uh, Continuum, uh, which is uh, another RPG that is role playing in the yet. I remember, yes, I remember role play, that, role that playing was, in the role playing in the. That was a good idea. It was a good idea, but the execution was a little bit less. So, yeah, yeah, I um, it's I, I took from it in two two things. One was uh, a kind of an idea on what a time traveling society might look like, and so it was kind of it's kind of an inspiration for the the various time traveling factions that make up the cross time game. Um, not, I don't think any of them are direct, um, direct inspirations, but just the the concept of of what that might look like, uh, and then it was a model of what not to do in terms of time travel rules, because uh, Continuum is very, very complicated in terms of how the time travel works. Yeah, and it was, uh, it was one of those games that came around in the late '80s, early '90s, where a lot of designers had this massive boner for oh, try, for trying to make their games as um, complex as possible in the name of realism. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. This is where Phoenix Command comes in with it with its <laughs> yeah. um, 
ridiculous crunch to the point where I've I've had it as my whipping boy for years, and I've sp and I've outright stated I will not run Phoenix Command again unless I'm paid in advance. <laughs> uh, yeah, I I've never read Phoenix Command, but I I've uh, I've read read about it, and yeah, did you, definitely. Did you ever read the Aliens Adventure game? Uh, no, not familiar with that so one. That, that was based on the same rule set. Hmm. Gotcha. Um, now, I will I will throw one name out there, and I'm curious if this is one that was brought to your attention while developing Cross Time, and that is the book the end the story the end of eternity by um, Asimov. Yes, yes, that's definitely what, something that uh, was another um, another kind of indirect influence. Uh, it's um, uh, it, it is in my my uh, appendix N as it, as it were in the um in the book uh it's it's a uh it's a definitely you know it's about shaping history and uh but it's uh there isn't the 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 fight between changing history back and forth that is this kind of the central premise of cross time but it, it's there's definitely a um and it, one of one of the influences that kind of shaped the concept Back in the day, I haven't read End of Eternity for twenty years, probably. But yeah. Yeah. So I, I can I can see it. It's it was one of those obvious ones. That's why I waited a bit to bring it up. Mm -hmm. But when you're dealing with the concept like time travel on the on these high concept um, ideas, much like say FTL in certain science fiction works, there's a lot of ways that that can be interpreted. Uh, in terms of how it, in terms of how it works, so what would be the rules of how time travel even works? Is it through through certain devices? You already mentioned certain points in time. Um, mm -hmm. So how so how would the thing actually um, work? Sure. Well, every every time traveler in the game has a, a cybernetic implant uh, that allows them to travel through time mm -hmm. uh, it's you know the specifics of how it works is not really relevant to me so it's uh i just say like it can tra tra teleport you and i think i say like 50 pounds of material all of which you have to be touching something like that just basically a you know you can carry some gear with you but it's you're not gonna be taking a truck back to the 16th century. Um, a little and, version of the nothing goes back rule from Terminator? Yes, exactly. Um, and then uh, the, what I'm more interested in is the, um, the co what, I, what I call meta time, which is the, the premise that I, that I have, which is really uh, trying to prevent predestination paradoxes. Uh, the idea is that there are two axes of time. Uh, there's the, the T axis, which is, which, you know, is regular going forward and, and back in, in time. And you uh, try and travelers can go either direction on the T axis. And then there's the M axis, which is every tick of <clears throat> the M axis meta time is one different iteration of the universe of all of the entire timeline and uh when when you travel through through time you move forward on the m axis and so you uh, move into a version of the of history that is um that takes into account everything that has all the time travel that's been going on in that tick of meta time mm -hmm. which is not a problem when you're the only time traveler it is a problem when there are lots of time travelers uh, as you will find that whatever history that you came from you may show up and see that someone has radically changed history in the meantime uh you know that, that if you you know you if you and someone else uh, another time traveler leave at the from the same meta time tick uh, and they go back further in further in t further back in time than you do in the new tick. They have the chance to 
screw with time so that you show up in a time in a version of the of history that is very unrecognizable to you mm-hmm. uh and the the meta time access no one can go backwards in it uh so there there is still a uh you can't can't go back to a, a different version of uh of reality of the timeline you have to continue changing it from from where you're at if you mm-hmm. want to fix some, something that someone else did you got to go back got to go forward in meta time and go to go back in in uh in regular time to stop them mm-hmm. I, can, um, I can get that so and I, th- I think it's important to establish these kind of rules when you are doing um, when you are doing time travel now on the espionage part of things I've, I've said that there's a kind of pendulum when it comes to spy fiction um, on one end of the pendulum is the pulpy stuff a la James Bond and on the other end is the more grounded stuff like say Jason Bourne uh, when it comes to the approach to the, the espionage aspect where where would you say uh, cross time falls in uh, definitely <clears throat> definitely Jason Bourne um, it's uh, that that's the the number one uh, number one touch point for mm-hmm. uh, for the espionage in the game that's uh, I I, for reality redacted, which has the same kind of uh, mood of of espionage, I I would pitch it as uh, Jason Bourne meets The Matrix. Uh, so this is very similar uh, sort of mood to it. Uh, there is there's a level of uh, you know the the fact that is time travel makes it you know takes it a step up, and then also the the characters have. Uh, cybernetic implants that give them special abilities, but ultimately is intended to be grittier, like uh, like Jason Bourne, where you know J- J- Bourne is able to do uh, sort of out out of the ordinary things, uh, but the 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 reality of the of the morality in particular is you know. Is not as black and white simple as as uh, James Bond, and uh, the the mood should definitely be uh, that it, things are shades of gray in the morality of cross time, and uh, and that there are serious consequences to your actions, and a and there's there's not not the time to uh, screw around. Screw around, yeah. Hold on one moment. So, continuing on from that, fate is usually pretty freeform, but you do have a kind of archetype set up with ops, with ops spec, ops operational specialty. And given that there's a handful of the, of them, I'd like to go into each and kind of get a feel for a character in a, in other fiction that might be a close equivalent to it. Sure. Yeah, uh, no problem. Yeah, so the operational specialty or op spec is essentially the the character classes of the game, and I I do that because I I like uh, I like character classes in terms of of those archetypes of creating characters that uh, feel different from each other uh, and that that definitely have mechanical and narrative distinctions from each other that is can be harder to get from a, a skill-based system, um, you know, a more free-form skill-based system. Not always, but certainly can be, and that's, that's why I've uh, oftentimes uh, worked with uh, these sort of archetypal class-type class um, concepts. Okay, uh, so let's... let's uh, so we start. Yeah, uh, let's start with uh, the clandestine operative. Yes, the clandestine operative is our, our first one. Um, that's the the sneak thief. Um, the uh, there's there isn't isn't a really good example of it from uh, from 
time travel fiction specifically. I, I tried to think of one, but I was the the best I came up with was uh, Carbon San Diego. Um, and this doesn't uh, have to be limited to ju- to just time travel or espionage fiction. Any kind of fiction. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, then probably the uh, the the one that comes to mind the most is uh, Parker from Leverage. Uh, mm-hmm. The the it's the you know the the consummate thief the one who can sneak into a place uh, and steal something from the vault and come back out be- without anyone noticing the yeah. the kind of character that um, that shows up in, in heist fiction. Mm-hmm. So next would be the command operative. The command operative is uh, c- can either be the the front point leader or uh, the the guy in the chair. Uh, so it could be uh, could be like uh, it's the 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 character. Um, uh, what what is what is the name of the character? I can't think of the name of the character. But the the operator from uh, the Matrix is is, a, is a, an example because mm-hmm. they're the you know, watching over the team and able to change things from the uh, from the outside, uh, and that's that's something that that's one of the archetypes that you can use for the the command operative, but it can also be the the boots on the ground type, like uh, uh, one an example from from time travel fiction is that I mentioned earlier is the uh, travelers, the the Grant McLaren, the Kind of the protagonist of the of the show is is a command uh, commander type. Yeah, I, th- I think you were thinking of um, tank when it came to the Matrix. Yes, uh, that yes, that's the one. Mm-hmm. So, and I'd say anybody who's doing these who's doing the operations, who's basically the um, le- the leader, what is is something that could be applicable. And I'll, if I wanted to stretch it, I could even throw in uh, Danny Ocean. Yeah, sure, absolutely. Uh yeah, any anyone who's who's making the plans and uh working on on the the bigger picture is, is definitely fits into that that archetype of the command operative. Yeah. So the next one on the list is deep cover. Yeah, the so deep cover that's uh, any sort of con artist um the uh Sophie from Leverage. I, I use Leverage as a, a a a touch point for a lot of these because they're really good archetypes mm-hmm. um, for the for the sort of even though it's not it's a you know heist fiction rather than spy fiction. There there's a lot of overlap. Um, so th- that's the um, the the sort of the deep cover is is the the undercover operative, the person who's always pretending to be someone else. Uh, and you know they, they have the the skills and this cybernetic implants to help them do that and to you know create really great illusions and uh, disguises and such. Mm-hmm. I'd I'd say your professional li- your professional liars your grifters would certainly be applicable. Mm-hmm. Yes, any 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 grifter character yeah. definitely fits in there. Probably, I'd say probably the biggest example would be the protagonist from Catch Me If You Can. Yeah, absolutely. He would be he would be a perfect perfect example. Oh, but next is field scientist. Yeah, the field scientist. Uh, those are two kind of uh, related uh, archetypes that kind of fit in there. Is either the um, the engineer uh, like uh, Doc Brown from. Uh, Back of the Future uh, is you know someone who the guy the guy who invented time travel and can deal with all of that kind sh- of shenanigans is someone who could be a field scientist, uh, but also designed to fit into the archetype are the medic. Um, so the um, the the doctor character, you know, whoever you there's you know a million doctor characters from fiction, but uh, the the f- the field field medic, someone who can deal with. Uh, injury and uh and that sort of thing in in the the field rather than you know a diagnostician or it's you know someone who works in the hospital um so those are the two kind of uh archetypes that that fit into the field scientist 
mm -hmm. model. Yeah, I can I can certainly get that. Oh, obviously the next would be the intel would be the intelligence operative. Yes. So the intelligence operative is the the archetypal spy. They're the the people who uh, to collect intelligence. Um, that um, they uh, observe and uh, you know spy on on people. Um, they're also also into that is kind of the 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 temporal cops as much as they exist in cross time. It's not really a big concept but they're the investigators and and interrogators um show up in the intelligence operative uh archetype yeah uh, and i suppose this one won't might not have a str a very strong parallel but the meta historian yeah so the meta historian is is a uh, an odd one, um, but the the idea is um, is a historian character uh, or a guide character. They're, they're the person who knows everything about every when. Uh, the so the something like um, the TV show Timeless. Uh, there there's a the protagonist Lucy Preston is a historian that uh, knows everything about. All the histories, places that they they go, and that's sort of the the model for the meta historian. They, you know, they're the, they're the one who who gets to exposit about where it is that they're going and what it what they what we know about seventeenth century France or whatever. Um, and then uh, it's can also be not getting that knowledge not from an academic sense, but from more of a uh, a tour guide sense in our in a in the uh, uh, playtest game that I ran, one of the characters was a meta historian who uh, just wandered around the timeline, having fun and taking lots of drugs and sex. Uh, so he knew everything about every place, not because he had studied, but because he had just been there and partied there. Mm -hmm. I I can. I can certainly get that. Uh, the next one would be the military operative, which is probably pretty straightforward. Yeah, very straightforward. It's just you know the soldier. Um, the the best time travel version of this is the well the, the entire uh, main cast of Terminator. You know Sarah Connor and uh, Kyle Reese and and what have you are are very much the military operative. Just the the soldier. The the only only difference is that in in my game they've they've got cybernetics that allow them to to you know they could they could take on the the Terminator without so much trouble because they have the the technology. Yeah. Oh, uh, then of course there is the political operative. Yeah, uh, the political operative is the uh, the diplomat and the. Uh, manipulator. Uh, so they they have abilities that allow them to, like, uh, essentially the neuralizer from Men in Black that lets you change someone's memory, uh, or and the ability to uh, uh, change someone's emotions, read minds. Uh, so that they anything that allows them to manipulate people is is the concept for the political cooperative. Um, and so they're they're the the I don't know Littlefinger from uh, from Game of Thrones might be a, a good archetype for the political operative, someone who's uh, you know manipulating from beside behind the scenes, uh, and and or any sort of uh, diplomat character who's who is you know the, can puts their best foot forward and can talk circles around people who's also uh, fits into the archetype. Mm -hmm. And the and w and the last would be the tech operative. Yep. The tech operative uh, or or technology acquisition operative, uh they are um 
a combination of engineer and scavenger. Uh, their their concept is that they are uh, they're there to instead of necessarily as much changing history, they are there to uh, f- get technology high technology from places in history and bring them back for the time travelers to use and so they have the ability to uh, manipulate technology they have nanites that they can create things with and they can um, overclock any technology that they find um i find i think the the doctor from doctor who fits into the tech operative uh oddly enough more than as a field scientist because he's really uh, an engineer uh, more than than a scientist in most of the most of the time uh, so that's that's kind of uh, the model there the, the the tech operative is a little more uh, comfortable with fighting than say the doctor yeah uh, and now with the, one of the <clears throat> things that I find interesting that you put in is you put in a whole sidebar regarding uh, aspects you know if you get stumped on aspects since aspects is one of the strengths and but sometimes weaknesses of the fate system since Mm -hmm. there i mean i I i've talked about this in core there's not a whole lot of guidance when it comes to what a good or bad aspect would be yeah um so i uh well this this is kind the use of aspects in cross time is a little unusual from a fate perspective it kind of comes from the fact that it was originally designed as a Cortex game because Cortex uh, uses traits, which are much like aspects, but they uh, are usually with a more uh, robust mechanical uh, interaction with the with character creation in, in Cortex. You, you're in several of the Cortex games, including Reality Redacted that I originally um wrote they you build your character around several traits and and those uh the traits affect your skills um and so i uh in translating this from cortex to fate i kind of kept some of that in the aspect system so unlike most um most fate games that may may have just minimal guidance regarding aspects there are a huge list of aspects that will that have specific mechanical benefits uh, to um, that will in, in influence your skills and uh, in in character creation for uh, as well as being usable to invoke and compel and and all the mechanical stuff that you can do with aspects mm-hmm. during the game uh, and then I, I I try to make it help make it clear how each of them are usable by i have these little as i think you you mentioned these little sidebars that say you know this is how you can invoke this aspect this is how you this aspect can be compelled um so that you have the sense of how it's going to to work in in the game Mm -hmm. um and then of course there's also the 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 more free form uh, high concept and trouble aspects that are central, you know, central to your character, but uh, don't interact with the um, with character creation directly in in uh, in cross time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I can I can certainly get that. Now with the, and I can and in the same vein, I can see I can see some of that some of the cortex DNA, especially with how you handle. Um, stunts and some of the features that each um, that each op spec has be large as well as well as the secondary implants because I'm not because I didn't see the um, relationship with refresh and stu- and stunts here in the same way. Yeah, uh, secondary implants is, are, are the things that I decided were not important enough to assign mechanics to but are are just sort of narratively things that every that all the um all the characters would have access to like the ability to time travel the ability to understand languages because that's very important when you're traveling through time um uh and in terms of the the stunts um yeah, yeah some of the the stunts are are came from 
the Cortex SFX system, uh, and some of them I, um, uh, some of them are original uh, to this iteration, uh, but um, they they interact. They they do interact with the um, with refresh uh, in the in the traditional fate sense. Right. Uh, I just have a, a a bunch of examples essentially in all of the in the various places. Uh, uh, like op specs to give places give you a, a starting point for stunts because I find that a lot of um, a lot of people struggle to come up with good stunts when they're when they're creating fake characters. Yeah. Now, when it comes to the faction system, mm-hmm. um, now obviously there's a lot of factions. There's too many for us to go into in the, in this interview, but with each, with each of them is. Is would there what would be the advantages and disadvantages play wise if the party decides to all go with the one faction or conversely go go with um go with everybody being from separate factions? Yeah. Uh well the factions are intended to first give the the characters uh some guidance on on where what they're gonna be trying to do. Um, and and why they're going to be trying to do it because each of them has a different philosophy as to the use of time travel, and then it's also uh, there's a, a small mechanical uh, benefit of uh, just increasing one one or another skill um, that associated with each um, each place. Uh, you know, OTL one of the main. Uh, factions that I happen to have up on the screen, uh, you, you can focus either your firearm skill or your logistics skill. Mm-hmm. And so, um, if you if everyone were to take on the same faction, uh, it might make the characters a little bit more samey. But it, because it's a relatively minor uh, part of creating the, uh, of creating characters, that I I don't think it would really harm anything. Um, what I've what I've seen in play is people prefer to uh, to each choose their own faction, and then you know, that that puts a little more effort on the GM to figure out why all these people are working together. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, I there is mechan- there's a you know a little bit in the book about you know multi faction teams why are people working together here are some ideas on why on what's going on um the centrally uh it is a considered a, a conceit of the setting that everyone is working uh it's generally working for either the revisionists who want to create utopia uh through manipulating the timeline or o t l who want to return the timeline to its original version mm-hmm. uh, and uh, because those are the, the the big two that go back and forth in the setting, and the other, um, and I, I've discovered in in play that the other factions are harder to uh, create adventures around, uh, at least because they're pretty pretty focused in what they what they want to do and what they're trying to do. So it's it's uh, if you want to do a very focused campaign, what that you know all of your your uh, scenarios are based around uh, eco terrorism for the green time faction or something. Then more power to you. But if we're trying to create a just, we want to go back and change time in various ways. It really seems to to work better to uh, have all the factions working for one of the big two factions. Um, but uh, from a from a gameplay standpoint of you know. What is it going to be like in play? I find that uh, people working for many different factions uh, expands their focus, uh, their their abilities. Uh, there, there's less less hyper specialization in the uh, in the group, and so they're able to uh, do more uh, more variety of tasks in the same way that. You know, you probably aren't going to want a a whole party of fighters. Hmm. Uh, it's going to be more capable if you can 
with dealing with different situations if you've got a wizard and a cleric in there. Yeah. Um, I remember running L5R and, ha- and having to use the whole Imperial, the whole um, Emerald Magistrate concept as a means to get people from different clans in the party in a way that made sense. That isn't just mm-hmm. you all meet in a tavern. Yeah, yeah I, I'm not that familiar with L5R. I've never actually played it, but I, I have a friend who, who's played a million hours of it, so I've heard lots of stories. And it, it definitely uh, seems to be a, a game where it's a little more challenging that, to get everyone together um, because of the, the different clans where it's, are so distinct and in their... Um, what they want and how they do things, and the, and their relationships with uh, with uh, with other clans, and you have a yeah, you have a similar thing when it comes to the factions and how they see each other. Yeah, there, so there's there's a section in each of the faction write ups that is is kind of uh, based on the how do all the vampire clans see each other from the White Wolf. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there, it's supposed to just give a, a basic role-playing conceit, um, and uh, you know all the so all the most of the factions should be able to work together. Uh, there's a few that that really can't. Um, uh, green time and the machinists are are green time is focused on nature, and the machinists want to work on high technology and so they have kind of opposite motivations um obviously the revisionists and otl that uh, have opposite ideas on what they what the purpose of time travel is uh, aren't going to work well together but most of them uh will work together you know the the archivists who want to study timeline and the free market who want to make money off the timeline and the hedonists who want to uh run around and have fun in the timeline all you know they should all be able to work together mm-hmm. so stuff like that yeah i can i can cert- i can certainly get that now were there in play testing cross time were there any cases you can think of of something that you had planned that created scenarios you didn't you didn't um account for when you were designing it uh, I'm sure there were. Let me try to see if I can think of anything, any good examples. Um, first thing that comes to mind is the uh, the idea of trying to make money off the timeline. That's not something that I'm... Ter- uh, money in general in games is not something I'm very terribly interested in. I'm not big on... Uh, magic items in D and you know the the grind of trying of collecting different plus one swords and uh making lots of and or making money to create your to build a castle or whatever uh and so the in in my playtesting there's been um uh, one player who was in uh two different two different games who in both of them really wanted to make money in the game and so it was trying it was kind of challenging to figure out the way best way to accommodate that uh, both uh in the narrative and mechanically um, and it's uh, i a lot of it was kind of just kind of playing things by ear uh and i i have i, I did decide that i didn't think it was a significant enough uh, piece of the game as I envisioned it that I wanted to make very robust support for it. So, you know, th- there is no uh, no mechanics for money in the, that actually are in the game. Um, there's, there's no uh, mechanics for... There are mechanics for gear. There's what... Uh, there's called... Um, requisitions where you're you know your your sponsoring faction can give you some gear throughout the um throughout the game but there's there isn't really mechanical support for trying to collect historical relics and sell them uh and you know that's something that one particular player that i worked with was uh 
in, very much engaged with, but uh, I didn't find a, uh, find it important enough to the concept of the game to build very much robust mechanical support for it. Mm-hmm. Um, as a small side note, there, there was a um, a device that he uh, that I kind of created off the top of my head for him that. I don't remember what, off the top of my head whether I actually wrote it into the game, which was uh, something that allows you to, um, you know, like this little box. You stick it on a thing, and the, then you can teleport the thing back to your your time travel base, um, mm-hmm. rather uh, rather than uh, having to take it with you, you know, grabbing onto it. Because the because of the nature of matter time, once you leave a uh, a sp- a timeline you can't go back so um that you w- once you are embedded the idea is that you got to finish your mission before you leave or else you're not going to be able to finish your mission um so uh, there's no oh i've got this got this thing i'm going to zap back home and then come back uh, mm-hmm. so that's why i created that I get. I gotcha. Now, with that with that in mind, what what do you have planned um, down the road? Whether it be through cross cross time or other projects. Uh, it's a, it's a good question. Um, right now, I am starting to uh, revisit a game that I worked on uh, a long time ago. Um, it's another fate system. It's it's more of a high fantasy game, though. Um, it's uh, though uh, more think more China Mieville, uh new weird than uh, Tolkien Lord of the Rings high fantasy. Uh, it's a definitely a. I I don't have I haven't settled on a name for it at this point. I'm. The working title is Infinitum, uh, but it's it's about a, a city at the center of the multiverse that uh, has a lot of uh, high magic and strange bloodlines of different uh, kinds of humanity. The you know, people who grow plants on their skin and people who uh, have literal fire in their bellies and um, this, that, and the other. Uh, people with bestial features uh and so that's that's something that i i originally designed uh, 15 years ago um to uh for my my then girlfriend now wife uh, because she wanted to play a fantasy game and i didn't want to play D D, so i designed something for her uh and uh i i set it aside for, for years because I really felt like it was too big a project for where I was at the time because um, it's there's a it's all it's detailing a big city and everything that goes on with it this uh, and so it's it's a big project uh, it really needs some good art which we'll we'll see how if I'm able to figure out how to get that to happen um, but uh, that's that's my my next project. Um, trying to come back to that and turn it from because I I, uh, I designed it originally for for Spirit of the Century and Dresden Files Fate, and so now I'm going to uh, bring it into more modern Fate sensibilities. Um, you know, not because there's plenty of plenty of work that still works. Uh, so it's you know, I'm not going to start from zero, but there's definitely some stuff that. Um, some definite changes that came came about in transitioning to more uh, modern the, the current Fate edition. Mm-hmm. I can I can certainly get that. But uh, with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness that happens here. And well, thank you for having me. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. 
And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!